This episode of Quitters is brought to you by Primal Kitchen. Guess where I was last week, Chad? Where were you? New York City. And I was staying what? with my cousin, whom I love very much. Shout out to Colin. Mm-hmm. Guess what he had? I was gonna. I was just cooking in the morning, making some eggs. What did he have? Primal Kitchen avocado oil spray for the pan. Just there. Oh, cool. I didn't bring it. I didn't. I didn't promote it to him on his I, own, independently. I was so happy and so proud because that is a staple in our mm. kitchen right now. It is an absolute staple. I use it for everything. It's the perfect pan prep. I just made that word up. Pan Delicious. prep. Pan prep. That's a real pan word. Prep. Is well, it? we have all kind of primal kitchen stuff in our kitchen, including the avocado pan spray. We also have stuff like the vegan sweet potato fries, the pesto keto cauliflower pizza. We just have like delicious primal kitchenness all over the place. You know, I was a child of the 80s. Back then, it was all no fat, no fat, no fat. <laughs> and because you need good fats, you need plant based oils and no refined sugar, and you also need delicious flavor so that you'll actually eat the food. Plant-based oils, you need them. They're part of your diet. They're they're an important thing for your brain and your body. And when I eat Primal Kitchen, I fill up, I feel good, I don't crash. I like it. I feel the same way. I feel like I'm eating real food, and then afterward, I feel like I have energy. I feel like I can just like, it's not all like, squishy and lumped up in my body somewhere. I don't feel gassy. <laughs> I just feel like I can I feel like I can lay down and I don't have to like sit up till my food digests. It's great. I'm a pretty clean eater. You uh are. Primal Kitchen slotted in really nicely with my with my current diet. They just made it easier. And they gave me more options. I really like it. I like their um salad dressings. I use them for everything by the way. I use them to mm. marinate, pour it on on salads, put it on uh, vegetables, anything you want. But Quitters listeners can save 20% at primalkitchen.com slash quitters or, like my cousin did, find Primal Kitchen products at your favorite local grocery store or retailer. Do it. It's so yummy. Well, I think you crash and burn with people enough times yeah, I think something's got to give. Like, like everyone's got like a wick, and then everyone's got a certain amount of dynamite at the end of that wick, right? Yeah. Now, if I've got a lot of dynamite at the end of that wick, <laughs> it's my job to make sure that wick's as long as possible. Like, that's my job. I can't like make the dynamite any less. Right. But I can work on I can work on making that wick wick longer. Today on Quitters, we have Avin Joja. Used to be a Nickelodeon kid. Definitely not a Nickelodeon kid anymore. He is, no. uh, he's, a, he's an artist. He's a filmmaker. He's clear. It seems like he has at least clarity on what he thinks and what he feels. And he gives it to you as though he is literally transparent, as if you can see through him. But he's not uncomplex at the same time, which is, which oh. is, con- that's a little confusing. Very complicated. And, uh, he is a Gordian knot, <laughs> the kind I like to untie. And I don't know that I have ever could, which is why he would endlessly fascinate me. So, Julie, what's a Gordian knot before you tell? Before a we very start the complicated show? like knot that like you can't untie. You, you, it looks like you know how to untie it. You can't. Okay. So it, oh, yeah. It's a mythical thing. All right. So today, right. join us. It's Avin Joja on Quitters. Hello. How are you? Hi. Hello. Hi. I'm Julie. Hi, Julie. Hey, man. I'm Chad. Hi. Hi, Chad. And we have been saying your name on Endless Loop after watching. Oh, yeah. But, but would you just Can say you tell it us for us again? Definitively, how to get it right? Yeah, Avin Jogia. So it's like Avin Jogia. Oh, Avin Jogia. Avin Jogia. Avin Jogia. Avin Jogia. Avin, that's, that's what I said. But no, we were saying Avin. Yeah. Avin. It's like so, Gavin without the G. Why does no one? Why don't you just say this? Yeah, why this is, is that not it? Your oh, IMDb? I say it every day. I say it every day. <laughs> I think at least once a day I say. It. Gavin, like without We're very the happy G. you're here, Avin. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Thank, thank you, you so for, much. Thank you for being here. I just, it's so funny. I just scrolled through like 30 photos of you um, in Google Images and each one, you know, you have a, you just like, you're very expressive in how you wear yourself. And then you uh, came on the screen and you were like a different version. I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Totally cool. different. Yeah. This is like hold away in uh, the Pacific Northwest, like in a cabin. Energy Avenue. Nice. Is that Fire. where you are? Yeah, that's where I live primarily. 
Yeah. You you live up in, near Vancouver somewhere. Yeah, I live up. Uh, I live outside of Vancouver, but yeah, in a in a little uh, a little cabin uh, almost all the year round. Yeah. Oh, you live. Oh, and you you're feeling good there. Yeah. <laughs> That's, That's great. fire. I, mean, I like, like that. the existential. Am I? Are you feeling good? There? I mean, no, it's very existential. But I'm also on the road. I'd say probably like eight months out of the year shooting. So it's a very short amount of time that I you do get some peace. in the cabin a year. Nice, um, man. Before we get to the existential dread that is Dormouse, that I, and I right. watched it last night, oh Chad God. wanted to ask you, what, Chad wanted to I go did. back in time for a minute, I, y- if um, you don't mind. Yeah, I did. I did. Eventually, we're going to get to like something that you've quit, naturally, mm-hmm. given the premise of the, the show. But you, you started in this very young, and mm-hmm. I was talking to a friend recently who just left Nickelodeon. He was a producer, director there, and... He was telling me he felt like the adults there did not do their their job of humanity to do right by the children that work, you know, in TV and film who are like little, you know, they're little stars, like all of them mm. and little artists. And I'm wondering what, as someone who started so young, like what was your experience with uh, adults, you know, in the way that they took care of you as not just like a property of a network or something, but like as a kid, as a person? I think it depends by what metrics you measure all that. I mean, like, as an adult, you can look down at it and be like, oh, I see, I see where there, there was less care or, uh, or there was an inf- um, infantilizing of these young working professionals. I mean, my day-to-day life was fine. Like, everything was fine. Like, it's good. I think that in retrospect, when you think about how much, how much money uh, mm-hmm. a company like that makes off a show like that, Mm. And and then you think about what, um, you know, I I come from gov- like government housing. I come from like low. I don't have, um, I didn't come from a family that had like a, a like a sturdy financial backing. This wasn't like some cute hobby, right? That my family said, oh, let them do it. I was good at it, and I could make money doing it, and I could help my family joyfully. Like that's that's what I wanted to do, and that's what I you know enjoy doing with my, you know, existence, as well as like being an artist and all that stuff I do. My treatment as a, by adults was, you know, as fine as it is in any working environment. I mean, Uh it's, it's kids working. It's, there's levels to this. I mean, I mean, I'm sure you were aware, Julie, when you were working on Modern Family, we're like, there's there's the kids, you know, they pumpkin time happens, they blow up, but it's an industry. It's an industry time. I remember like, as soon as I was old enough on that show, because I didn't, I started young, but I didn't start that young. I was like 17 years old, 16 years yeah, old. Yeah, sure. Um, you said it, uh, that you had chosen it, unlike some, yeah. you felt like, unlike some of the kids that you oh, worked yeah. with who were like shoved into it. Yeah, they're like nine. Like, yeah. what is right. that? Like, I, I, don't, yeah, I don't know what that is. As a 16-year-old, 17-year-old, like dropping out of high school and, and moving to LA with a purpose to like do this thing, what I think is, is massively overlooked is... is um, it's not some cute hobby for these kids. Like this is how a lot of them are paying their bills and paying other mm. people's bills. I would say that was that. That's the thing that I I find to be a little bit uh, more um, not as not as enjoyable uh, upon looking back at it. But also, I was like, now I was seventeen. Like I know you know Julie. Like if get by get by the kids that are like in a shot. <laughs> yeah, I'm always trying to get like by who's got the pumpkin time that's like gonna blow up, and then oh, you just of sort of course. like. Yeah, you just what, sort of wait, slide. what is pumpkin time? I'm sorry. Pumpkin oh, yeah. time. You know how in, in Cinderella, <laughs> that she, the pumpkin, the character oh, turns back into a pumpkin at midnight. Okay. Kids <laughs> on the call sheet, it will say if they're if they were call time was 7 a.m., then they only can work a 10 hour day. And now, gotcha. uh oh, the pumpkin uh-oh. time. I just ran into fucking math. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> just, yeah. No, the pumpkin time is going to be 10 hours plus lunch later. Yeah, and so that's basically it. they 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 have to stop working. They got to stop. You could be in the but middle if, of a scene and they're like pumpkin. But if time. you're an adult. What you can do is, as an actor, is sort of find yourself just randomly. You're like by like the kids section. You're like, t- like do some background work. You're like, oh, talking to the kid. Like, hey, what's up? All and of then sudden, you got to go home too. Uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> but you were like young and but still mature enough to know that you were doing this, you know, because you loved it, but also to make money for your family. It sounds to me like you have a lot of respect for the. I hate the the C R A F T word because I'm. But you you respect yeah. it, and yet you also have taken such a left turn 
I just watched your movie Dormass last oh, night. Nice. And I couldn't believe it. I Because I had read, you said it was a love letter to Vancouver. And this ties to something you had just said was, you grew up in government housing. So I was re- watching it. And I was like, I've been to Vancouver a lot in my life. And I was like, this is a Vancouver I've never seen. Mm. But it was, a, it, so it was a love letter to your Vancouver, mm. to your, and very gritty and reminded me very much of the time I spent there in the 90s. The whole vibe of the movie felt super 90s. And I really loved that. And I loved seeing kind of, gosh, how can I say this? A CD underbelly, it's just gritty. It's it mm. without borders. And I really appreciated yeah. that. Well, well, first of all, thank you very much. Now, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, um, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, like, you know, like I said, really, anyone watching the film is a, is a joy. But um, for me, it's very strange to have uh, thought of it and, and worked on it for as long as you do. And then people are now watching it. It's just like they can do it like that overnight. It's very weird. But uh, yeah, no, it's a different Vancouver than the one that's presented, I think, to most people, especially us. The, 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 the community of actors and people who go across the border to shoot in Vancouver, you're like, you know, in the fancy hotel and you do the fancy thing. And then that's, you know, you're pretty, it's pretty white glove, you know. And so for me, just trying to be able to tell a story that, uh, again, again, like all these sort of versions of, especially when you talked about can, uh, Canada, like all these versions of, of Canadian film, that's just so important to... To know that there is like, it's not just this one singular version of um, our country's identity and, and to sort of expand upon that. And that's, a, I, you know, I take that as a, as a compliment when you say that because all these people have, have been here and all this has been here in Canada. So it's just it's just about like shining a light on it and showing um, different versions of that. And also just like making a fun little scrappy DIY punk rock it's film. It's very I mean, yeah. punk rock. That was yeah, the 90s. Thing. It's like the very inspired by like, this used to be like... Um, Vancouver used to, it's still, it's, you know, there's some great punk rock bands here that I, I are in the film. I got their music in the film. But um, yeah, just to sort of support the, 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 what was really one of like the 90s and early 2000s um, without placing it as a period piece, but it just sort of exists in that world. As somebody who came from the Nickelodeon world and then, mm. and I asked this as somebody who was on a network show for a while, mm. it, it, stepping away and redefining yourself, I know you did, you did Now Apocalypse. You played a gay character. Mm. And then this, though, is completely out of your brain. Written, directed, mm. everything. Is it hard, easy, fun, exhilarating to subvert what people think they know of you from being a a, a kid actor? I think, I, I guess, I think here's the thing, like, uh, and this is kind of going back to the first question that you, that you had, uh, Chad, was like, at a certain point, I was an adult. I go on this thing. You said, like, I like the, you know, the, the craft. We don't, you know, the unsayable word. <laughs> but, like, um, I uh, I didn't expect to get on to, to, to Nickelodeon. The thing about Nickelodeon is they're just looking for precocious children. Half of those are really good gospel, out of the church, singing good folk. <laughs> right. And the other half are deeply ADHD, uh. like high school dropouts. Problem kids. These are the Which people. Who are you? <laughs> what do you think? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like you're leading us somewhere. I want to know where you're no, leading I, us. No, I just, I mean, like, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, like, um, when you get involved in Nickelodeon, they're looking for people who have the lights on. And a lot of kids have mm. the lights on for various, various reasons. I was mature because of just the way that I grew up in the world that I come from. That's they, wanted, they want that oh. maturity. Uh, does that dichotomy of like types of kids, does that create any kind of like cult? Like, is there like a, it's like two different types of X-Men. Is there like a clash at all? Or is it, <laughs> does it create any kind of weird chemistry? Yeah, you just I, know. I'm I curious. mean, like, yeah, yeah. And it's funny how they just sort of start to, you sort of start to find the people who are like, oh, I see why you're here. Yeah. It's unlike any other art form or weird thing that t- television, pro- like when you go, when you, when you do a show, a network television show or a cable show, everyone's like fully fledged people. By that uh-huh. point, you know, they've, they've, they've gone through their, you know, whatever they, whatever the way they grew up and they're, you know, they're pretty solid. Like these are really new people. And uh-huh. a lot of them are coming off of whatever they were raised and coming off of however, you know, your, your sort of circumstances and trying to find themselves as, as professionals. To go back to your point, Julie, about the, the switch, it wasn't really a switch for me because I was just, I, I was just standing there. And Nickelodeon was like, you're precocious and you have the lights on. I had a lot of like reservations about going on Nickelodeon in the first place because I was like, this is sort of like not where I see my 
what I want my art going, but that's but that's to say that that's a very young man's understanding of what all this means. And now a word from our sponsors. You know what I don't understand? What? I don't understand when jogger became a thing, but I also decided I don't care because I tried my new Viore joggers. They are amazing. Have you tried yours? I am currently wearing my joggers. I guess. <laughs> and you are an actual jogger, so I feel like these are perfect for you. You jog. I would never jog in my joggers. That's the crazy thing. I jog in my Viore leggings. Oh. Yes, I do. But I think that I feel like if I wear leggings, they are for exercise. But my joggers are like go anywhere pants. Like, I see. My friend, you know, my friend calls them my putter pants because I putter <sighs> around in them. <laughs> a putter, but they look nice. They feel good. Oh, they look They're so good. They're just everyday pants that you don't feel like you're a schlub in. That's right. They're designed to look great in everyday life outside the gym. That means you can wear them to a coffee shop, walking to the park, uh, going on a date, going to a bar, going to a friend's house, going to a book club. They look great. And they're so comfortable. Oh, my God. They're so comfortable. I just love that you said going to a book club. I'm going to throw know. my Viore's on and go to a book club. It's like, just, <laughs> do you belong to a book club? No, I don't. I don't. <laughs> I think when I looked at you, I saw a book club and I just said it. Well, back to Viore then. Fine. Viore is an investment in your happiness. For our listeners, they're offering 20% off your first purchase. Get yourself some of the most comfortable and versatile clothing on the planet at viore.com slash quitters. That's V U O R I. Dot com slash quitters. Not only will you receive 20% off your first purchase, but enjoy free shipping on any U.S. orders over $75 and free returns. Go to viore.com slash quitters and discover the versatility of Viore clothing. Julie, it recently came to my attention that President's Day is this month. Yes, yes, I know this, Chad. It is right there on the school calendar and my whole life is a school calendar. Have you ever noticed how presidents start to look old very quickly? Yeah, it's a very stressful job. I mean, first up, my personal fantasy boyfriend, Barack Obama, when he started his presidency, he looked like a young foxy dude. And by the end, he had quite a few grays, still a total fox. But I bet he wasn't getting a good night's sleep. You know what those presidents need? Presidents like Barack Obama, who age quickly in presidency? A sop of mattress? Sop a mattress. Exactly. That's what I think. <laughs> Maybe former President Barack Obama should have gotten himself a Sattva luxury mattress like the ones we both have. I love getting into my luxurious three inch pillow top. I fall asleep right away, wake up refreshed. That's the best feeling in the world, that right away refreshed feeling. If you're listening, Mr. Barack Obama, you're in luck. Because during the month of February, in honor of President's Day, you'll save $200 when you purchase $1,000 or more at satva.com slash quitters. That's S-A-A-T-V-A dot com slash quitters. The lights on, that's like such a, I really like the way that you're saying that. You are, you're saying a lot of stuff that is really good use of language. It's really cool. The lights on, what does that mean? Does that mean like charismatic, smart? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Performative. So, you know, some kids, you just go like, oh, that kid's got, like, that's kids. Like, they're here. Just a bit more, their 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 consciousness arrived a little earlier than everyone else's. Yeah, well, that is a beautiful way of putting powerful. it. And, and yeah. to what do you attribute that? Is it just the luck of the draw? Was it the way you were raised? I'm not even saying it's a good thing. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> I've yeah. been, up with this, I've been conscious longer. You, you've been conscious for a while? It sort of sucks. Yeah. Um. So like. Yeah. <laughs> so like it's it's about it's like a yeah yeah it's a benefit from I think you know whatever nine to twenty five because everyone's like wow you just are right you're there already shit but then you've already been you've been conscious for longer and so that so a, a long enough timeline unless you have a uh, these systems in place and like good mentality in place that consciousness can like sort of. That awareness, that constant awareness can sort of, uh, I think, eat away at you and, and, and turn people into sort of um, have to create problems for people. Damn. So you've, been, you've been focusing on being a creator and mm. writing your own story, telling your own narratives and it, outside of the Hollywood system. Mm. Is that 
by design? Or is that the way the money flows? Is or are you just sick of trying to battle the the Hollywood ladder? I know you've you've made comments about it before, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, I think I think at a certain point you you go path of least resistance. Right. And then that path starts to feel like, oh, like if I can circumvent something and I can create stuff that I think is genuinely like there's so little and I use the uh, this word like really, really delicately, authorship, huh. true mm-hmm. authorship in mm-hmm. art anymore, especially in long, big form art like movies. You know, I, like when I first started wanting to make this movie, this movie's you know, it's about like, it's, a you know, not to give any spoilers away, but there's, you know, they uncover um, the people in power are, are use it like our sex traffickers and they uncover right. that the police are not going to be there for them. And the police yeah, are let's engaged. let's just pause for a second in case tell our tell our audience for those um, who don't know the movie it's yes. Dormouse. Yep. I watched it on Apple. You can watch it all kinds of places, but it is a very '90s indie punk rock feeling movie that you wrote and directed mm. about a young woman in her 20s yeah. who's a cartoon artist who has a very frank relationship with her sexuality. Mm. And the world and and how sex is used as a uh, bargaining chip, basically. Yes. And she understands this. And it then turns into kind of a classic, in a way, a classic film noir. Yeah. I thought. Yeah. And we so basically it becomes this woman who's uh, sort of like lost in her uh, life, doesn't exactly know what she wants to do. Like nothing bad's happening to her, but she's just like, I don't know, like in a mid place, as a lot of 25 year olds are. And then these people start going missing from the club and her and her friend Ugly have to figure out why these people have gone missing. And she sort of uncovers a larger plot of people in power using their power to oppress the disenfranchised and through the manner of sex trafficking and through the manner of like, a, you know, just suppression and, and also in, in integrated with the police. So when I started writing this seven years ago. Wow. Seven, I was 23 years old and I wrote this. The mainstream like society wasn't really aware of the treatment of uh, black and brown bodies as, as it comes to police and justice. So, and I'm not, I'm saying that to say that it was impossible to get people to be like, this is something worth making. And that's where that kind of like working outside of the Hollywood system starts to occur. Cause you can walk into a bunch of offices and you say the thing and you show them the thing and they go, well, yeah, but then why, like what, like this is a, fin- this story is silly or fantastical or whatever. And then over seven years, these, you know, I, and I, I've said this before, like, I take no pleasure in the idea that, like, this has become more true, more right. valid. Right. And know, society has caught up finally to the fact that what you're telling is kind of a, uh, what's well, a bit of a microcosm or an allegory, but mm. I like what you just yeah. said. You said it better uh, that, that nobody takes black and what happens to black and brown bodies, bodies seriously. seriously. And then, and then I don't want to make a movie that's so direct because yeah. that's a fucking bummer. Like, right. I don't want to watch that movie. I, I want to watch a movie where there's a hero and they shoot the bad guy. And uh-huh. um, we say some things and everyone leaves the movie theater being like, wow, I want to be that person today. I'm going to wake. I'm going to I'm going to spend my whole day making sure like I am as powerful as that person because that person inspired me to be powerful today, even though all the things working against me. So to long-winded uh, way of saying working outside of the Hollywood system allows me to make a film like that. Although it took like <laughs> a long time to make it, it allows me to make a film like that to a certain degree and make it not tragedy, uh, to make it um, heroic and not like uh, what I sort of consider to be like sort of tragedy uh, pornography or sal- right, salacious. Right. I, I guess my... Um, if I, I like that to, word, tragic yeah. pornography. It's yeah. great. Tragedy it's just, porn is... Yeah, that, it's what it, it is. And and, yeah. and, and and I feel like it's not helping. Like, I guess I could have got, made a film at 23. I could have written a film about being mixed race and being brown and how my brown dad wants me to be a doctor and my mom and mom's white family and my dad's brown family don't get along. I could have got that movie made in one year. Mm-hmm. Easily. In the system. Because the system wants you to go, I see your face, I see what your face represents, and that's what, how, well, that is the entirety of your contribution as, your, as, as it comes to your artistic merit. I found that to be sort of like, I'm oppositional defiant by my nature, and I'm like, no, nah. <laughs> I'm going to make a film about, you know, 
these two kids, these two like, you know, live, not look like me, but they're sort of, they're black and brown kids and they're going through this mystery fairy tale thing. And that's more and more interesting to me. But um, yeah, this is a long way of saying like outside of the Hollywood system started off as, a, as a, something that um, was path of least resistance, but it's also become, so long as I can make the films out, uh, that interest me, I'm going to continue to do that. And that's not to say I won't work in the system at one point, but I think training myself outside of the system is going to be way more beneficial than training it inside. From a, like a nuts and bolts standpoint, how did you do it? Like, how'd you get it? You know, where'd mm. the money come from? Did you use your own money? What does outside the system look like to, to people who have never done it that way? Well, I mean, uh, I have the benefit of being raised in Canada. And so we have government funding for films because there seems to be like, a, you know, a supporting of the, of the arts to a certain degree. Uh, financially to get people's films that wouldn't wouldn't get made normally. I literally, I was just listening to this uh, Van Peoples um, quote today, the director. Um, and he's like, ah, you know, I, I, cu I couldn't make his, you know, he's, you know, he's a black filmmaker in the 60s. He's like, I couldn't get my films made in, in America. Um, so I went to Europe and I got them made in Paris, which is a lot of, you know, black artists and, and artists of color would go to uh, Paris specifically to get their to get their films made, and then he was asked, "Was it any? Was it easier?" He goes, "No." <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like, <laughs> wait, really? That's the end of that quote. I didn't know that. <laughs> no, it's not. it wasn't easier. No, because it's not. I mean, I have the Canadian system, but then there's also this other level of bureaucracy. There's a certain type of film, as you said, that Canadians like to make. Yes, that Can the Canadian film industry likes to make. Yes, yes, and Canadian content, and it, yeah, the CanCon yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. And it's a really limited nation view of Canada. So then I'm now doing a whole other level of uh, pitching it, being like, yeah, there's all these other things, but like, these are Canadians too. Like these people, like this is part of the world into which, you know, it's Vancouver. This is, I grew up with these people. Like you can't tell me this is not Canada. What it looks like is, um, I would say the only skill set that is required that I can see, I can say undeniably that is required to be a filmmaker is tenacity. That's the only thing. I Everything mean, else is subjective. I guess so. I mean, to get it, to get, to get yourself to the starting line, tenacity. Mm -hmm. But then once you're there, it sounds like I, I, I've noticed a few self-diagnoses in here. I think I heard oppositional defiance <laughs> and possibly ADHD. Yeah. Did you, are, they, are those accurate? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I was. Uh, not, I'm not like TikTok ADHD. I'm like diagnosed <laughs> like as a child ADHD. I don't yeah. know what I don't know what TikTok ADHD is. Well, just just is. that, just that, just that. Like, people on TikTok are like, you know, like they're all saying to one another that they have ADHD. Uh, which I mean, yeah. I think a lot of people do have ADHD. A yeah. lot more people than they think. I was taken out of school and put into uh, like you know programs for being uh -huh. ADHD. You know. Um, and yeah, Did that image. help you? Did, was that um, informative? Yeah. Well, it was great because uh, it was experimental. Um, at the time, it was experimental uh, educational concept where um, if you just take kids uh, and let them hyper-focus on a subject for, let's say, feudal Japan, um, you can teach them English, you can teach them math, you can teach them geometry, you can teach them a bunch of stuff as long as they're obsessed, as long as they get to deep dive into this one singular subject rather than trying to go for a scope effect. So we took the entire year and learned about feudal Japan. So the, you know, that age of Japanese culture. And by way of that, I was learning, you know, maths and, you know, social studies and all the other and things. And how old were you? I was like uh, nine or 10, maybe 12. Maybe, no, That's maybe 11. nuts. Yeah. And then they cut funding for that program. And then I was homeschooled. And then you quit. Then I quit. I, then you quit <laughs> I high, school to high school I went back to high school for like a year and I was like, no, nah, this is not for me. This is silly. So I quit. Yeah. Well, there's a quit right there. What was it like to not be in school? And do you feel like it's ever held you back? My life has taken such a weird turn that it's never applied to any of the things. The one thing I would say is that secondary education is a cult. And it is nice. That is a nice cult where there's a bunch of people who went to the same schools yeah. And so when you arrive in, I wouldn't have been able to be a part of this community anyway, but when you arrive in Los Angeles or New York or any of the major cities in America and you know, all, then they have this sort of coded conversation about what schools they went to, you're just like, I literally have no, no idea about this. I never would, never would have known about this. So you it know? feels like a cult to you? In a way that like everyone in those 
situations really know each other quite well. And they work in the same industries. They go on to work in the same industries. So these are friendships that like, that create these pockets in each industry, whether it's finance or, you know, um, our industry or whatever, tech, you know, they all go to the same school. And so therefore now they're in the same industry. Post-secondary education is valuable for that just being inside of the community, depending on what community you want to be, be, be inside of, you know? You have like a profound clarity of like voice and point of view on most of everything that we've talked about so far. I'm curious, like, are there, what are the, the areas of uncertainty in your, you seem very thoughtful. You seem like you think a lot. Mm. And, and I'm curious, like, where are the area, where are the fuzzy areas in your thought? Like where you feel like, man, shit, I don't know which way is up in this, in this bracket. I mean, all of it. Like I, I you know, it, it, to be perfectly honest, like being able to articulate um, a point of view does not necessarily for me equal actual clarity in my life. Like I'm and, not, like I don't wake up being like, things are clear. I know exactly which, like it's an ever changing field. And I think that when you sort of observe patterns, I guess, to the, to the degree that I accidentally do, unwiring that and wiring that and making that all make sense and making a cogent point um, of it emotionally cogent point, like something that like actually is like to know how you feel about a situation becomes, becomes hard. I can give you all the information and, and, and my opinions in the, but I think as far as like, where do I feel uh, f- fuzzy is um, how to move through the world knowing what I know. Cause the knowing part of it has not been my, um, I haven't come up short in that regard. I don't think I definitely am aware of awareness, consciousness I've had for a really long time. Like I said, you know, uh, but um, the burden of that or the, uh, the problem with that is that now, what do you do with all that information? What do you do with all that awareness? How do you how do you make your actual life joyful from a day to day perspective and not drowned in the information? Because because it can be bleak, you know. I mean, this yeah. is a movie. Oh, yeah. The Dormouse is an angry movie. Mm. I, I and um, I want to I, I want to build on that. Qu- yeah, I, I, I everything you said just like it, it resonates, and I feel like some of your clarity of thought probably comes from the fact that you're so. You're curious. You're like asking mm. questions, asking questions, asking, and that leads to some answers that that probably feel very certain. You know, you you have sounds like in your art there's anger, mm. and also because the anger comes from awareness. I think I feel like you you're like not very many years, but a few years younger than me. I feel like you've come to a place of like understanding that if you just live in the awareness all the time, you're going to be miserable. Yeah. I'm like late to the party on that. I'm like honestly, literally right now, just getting that. How do you? It's, it, it feels like it's your responsibility to kind of do both, like as a person, to yes. be aware and also enjoy your life. How do you do it? Like, how do you balance it? How do you make time for both sides of that fence? I don't. People who are curious about uh, expressing the person, human, per, the hum, humanity or whatever, you have to be aware enough so that you're, uh, what you're making stuff about is p- potent or has a p- purpose. You know, it's just really about compartmentalizing those two things and knowing when, where the off switch is. Like, like in a writing sense, when I'm writing, I mean, in order to keep this movie going for seven years, you have to be angry enough. It's like, that was the, to me, that was the engine every day. I was like, well, I'm really, I don't know what to do about the world around me. I'm aware of all these systems of power. I'm aware of all the ways into which um, people um, are disenfranchised. I want to be an agent of some level of, like, I want to contribute to it in being different. And you need that sort of, whatever, that, that passion or that anger to keep the steam in the, in the, in the train, you know, to keep going. But um, after seven years, I can tell you I'm not a happier person. And I don't think, I would say if anyone asked me about my huge takeaway from this film making experience would be is that I um, am in desperate need of understanding how to find the off switch for myself and, and knowing that like i'm not i can't change it all but you that's got, it you that got I any, would... do you have any ideas like i think some people turn i mean i am grappling with some of this shit uh, at the, I, I, yeah. it's like it's so i'm engaged like it's so serious it's so urgent for me right now yeah. because someone else now has to live with me and yeah. and my 
intensity. Oh, yeah, that's, what I, that's what I wanted to ask about. Yeah. Is relationships. How does that play out in relationships for you? I I don't think uh, great. Like I, <laughs> I think that it's. Um, <laughs> I think that I don't think well. I think that like that's part of the thing that I've uh, been trying to cultivate is like to get myself in a, in a in a place where all this can be so important to me and so big to me and so um, have all the same levels of passion and, and urgency. But um, just creating that space. Well, that's why I mean that's why I live in this cabin in the middle. Of, you know nowhere you know because like i'm either like you know doing like this stuff or like acting or like trying to direct or like you know trying Uh to get a film off the ground and so it becomes a really radical relaxation becomes important to me because i guess it it seems to me that I've, i've been able unable to do things not in extremes so like the cabin by myself away thing is the only way I've been able to... I balance extremely, if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it yeah. doesn't sound like you balance with another human or a group of humans. Yeah, uh, and I have. And I have. And, I, and, I, and I, I, I've been able to do that. I think that at a certain point that it creates strain in your life. And I don't think it's very pleasant to be around. And I just know that from experience from like my own life, but like people in my... Family and people who also suffer from the same thing as um, as me, when it, especially when it comes to ADHD, it's uh, it's really uh, I think a lot harder. It's harder for other people to understand, first of all, in a relationship, and then it's harder even still if you're not talk about awareness, aware of of really the ways into which your being contributes to the general vibe of a house. <laughs> I, I was so- gonna like I was gonna ask, are you in that cabin because you want? Is that a service to others? Like, to, to keep space? <laughs> to remove yourself. And, and I want you to know, like, I'm asking all of this, like, earnestly, non-judgmentally, because I, I relate to it. Like, mm. is that to keep yourself, is that to keep your ferocity from, like, because everybody doesn't live like that. Like, everyone's not on 450 degrees the way that you are, as I can feel you through this screen. Is that about protection for them? Or is it protection for your mind, for you to focus? Like... Or you well, just I think you crash like and burn with people enough times. Yeah, I think something's got to give. And and at a certain point, you have to, you're responsible for your own, how long your wick is. Like, uh-huh. like everyone's got like a wick and then everyone's got a certain amount of dynamite at the end of that wick, right? Yeah. Now, if I've got a lot of dynamite at the end of that wick, <laughs> it's my job to make sure that wick is as long as possible. Like, that's my <laughs> job. I can't like make the dynamite any less, but uh-huh. I, can work on, I can work on making that lick, wick longer. That's been my sort of, I mean, literally with the with the sort of like removing the exorcism or the rem, the the surgery that this was of this movie, getting it out of my way and behind me. I got enough space right now to, and that's what I'm inviting in is is trying to figure out. So doing the movie made space for you. Now, yeah, because again, it's like seven years of me like, and I don't. I, I just wish I could do things a little bit more relaxed. And that's also, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, for, like you know. Dude, I, like, <laughs> I mean, to, I don't know how long we've been talking. You can't. Let me just tell you, you can't. You can't. It's yeah. not going to happen. Maybe it's you could gonna... play a character that's more relaxed. Yeah. Well, that's you, the other and, thing, too. That's the other thing, too. Like, because of the way I look or whatever, I'm constantly being hired as these, like, sort of, like, chill, like, you know, smoke <laughs> a cigarette, throw it, yeah, yeah. lean against a thing, like, guy. Yeah. And I'm like, this is, like, the complete opposite of who I am as a human being. Interviewing you is has been this is fascinating because I did it. I did my research. I did a little mini deep dive I, of, mm. of your years at Nickelodeon. There's tons of shit on the internet where you're like, you know, hi, welcome yeah. to the set, and Hell this yeah. is this, and this is craft service, and you know how to be that person. You yeah. can. It's not that you can't be that person, but you have decided, consciously or unconsciously, not to be that person. Do you know when that? happened for you yeah i think i just got to a point where like it's about energy and energy out and to your point about the cabin like that costs me more than this than this person like does this cost me more you just need to know how much uh something drains you and that particular type of like (laughs) it's like that meme of ben affleck smoking outside the you know, seen that thing of him just like smoking and he's just like so like drained. Um, yeah. um, but like, you know, at, at a certain point you have you have to be like, okay, this is going to shorten my wick. 
Uh, so I don't don't so don't do it. So being being that like TV charming. Yeah, princess for lack mode. of a better word. To be and I've had to I have got to be TV charming all the time, but I totally awesome. get it. And there's this person that I'm talking to right now is so real and I'm I find this really refreshing. But by no means are you attempting to be charming. You are just being real. Are you aware of of a time when was it when you were done being on Nickelodeon? Was it when when you were like, yeah, I'm not. That is that's too much energy. Um, yeah, I think um, I think at a certain point you just go to yourself like, what I'm pursuing next doesn't have anything to do with that. So many times during the the sort of length of my career off of Nickelodeon, they were like, okay. Here's the thing. Here's the next step. The next step is this particular thing. Right. And you're like, I don't want that ladder. Yeah, I don't want that. Someone, that's a great ladder for somebody, but it's not for me. Yeah. Right. And then so like I've been constantly forging my own thing. Now doing like shows with filmmakers I really respect. Um, now Apocalypse. Or even if it's within the same realm of, you know, light fare that I've done before, I always want to be the weirdest character in the movie, I don't, I, you know, I don't know. It's why I play so many like um, ridiculous uh, characters. It's because I, I just, the idea of just sort of simply showing up and being the charming guy, just, it just drains me way more than um, when I'm not, if I'm, if, I, if my skill set isn't being used, I, I, I feel drained. Is that other person like entirely divorced from who you are? No, um, no, 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 no. It's, it's, it's I think it's a, it's a version of me and it's, um, it's probably a, it's a less honest version of me, but uh. it's uh, more, mostly psychological armor. I think we all have psychological armor at a certain point and there's like a charm offensive that's a lot easier to, to do than necessarily, than, than to actually, to, than to do this. Right. But to because be, the, the charm the, offensive is making it easier for others as well. You're protecting yeah. yourself. At a certain point, it's, yeah, it's a like people pleasing thing too, right? It's yeah. Like, it's like at a certain point you're just like, yeah, this will get us through this engagement in right. the in the right. least in the least offensive way to either of us. Right. I, so I how mean, have you had you're... to go through all of this selling of this movie? Mm. And there's got to be a certain amount of that where you're like, I'm going to put on my 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 charming armor, mm. or do you just not do that? And you're like, it is who I am. I'm ADHD. I'm a little oppositional. I, I mm. I'm 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 smart, and I made a movie. Do you like the movie? Mm. Fuck you if it's you both, don't like the movie. But, but also, I I like <laughs> fucking with it. Like there's this thing I did this like thirst trap post where I was like it was some sort of garbage th- uh, post uh, tr- a thirst trap thing that I did. You do for the algorithm, and then you stop it, and you go like, is this how we promote right. things now? You know, uh, it is all intense for me. But what I'm finding more and more is the kind of the joy in the intensity of it all. Um, I, I did a show with um, Greg Araki called Now Apocalypse, which you mentioned earlier. And Henry Rollins was on it, who's like a, 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 a punk rock hero of mine. Black Flag. Angry dude, right? Like, like, c- c- yeah. c- like career angry. Like, that's what he, you know. And he's like the nicest guy in the world. And I think over time, he found the joy in being upset or being passionate and i'm trying to i think that i'm trying to refine that i think i had that joy at some point and i think i'd sort of like got lost in this uh, in the lost in the sort of like the the fog of 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 making a film but like re 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 getting back into returning to that sort of joy of being passionate and being and that 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 passion doesn't have to be angry it can be excitement and that's what I actually, that's my actual state, I think, more than anything else. is like the anger is, um, is passion with no uh, place to put it. I got to think about that. Anger <laughs> is passion with no place to put it. As soon as you that's- put it somewhere, it's excitement. Just like being nervous and being scared and nervous is just, it's just excitement misplaced. Like, you know, you're you're conscious. You're excited about the wrong thing. You're excited to fail. That's nervousness. If you're excited to do the job, then now you're excited, and it's not nerves. I think about like stage a lot. Like when you get stage fright before you yeah. go on, Fuck it's you. like what am I, I? I'm anticipating the performance 
Uh-huh. But if I concentrate on failure, then now I'm now it's nervous. Now I'm nervous. Now I have anxiety. And that excitement, that energy is I think it's not it's not very different. It's just a subtle way of reinterpret reinterpreting that thing. And I think that I'm I've somewhere along the lines, my excitement has sort of like veered into being angry because there's lots to be angry about but oh, i'd yeah. like to return to be uh, being excited <laughs> and now a word from our sponsors hi chad hey julie did you get your green chef yes i did and i ate it yeah, oh man wait which one two did you get this is cheesy artichoke chicken sandwich that sounds and good sesame ginger pork bowl and they were both Fantastic. They're both really good. Mine were really good too. I did a, mine was like a Parmesan chicken. And then I did a veggie one. There was a veggie pasta with like chickpea, creamy chickpea sauce. And my kids were super into it because they always say I can't cook, which I can't. I'm very bad at it. But Green Chef made me feel good about it. I felt good about them because they have zero waste. They are carbon neutral. I felt good about options. Yeah. They now have 30 plus recipes weekly. That means yeah. that you can eat different stuff every time you eat Green Chef. There's food for everybody on there, whether you are a vegetarian, a vegan, keto, paleo, or just just really dig food and want to eat it. Yeah, they got chicken, beef, salmon, USDA certified organic ground beef, USDA certified organic chicken, wild caught sockeye salmon. And now you can also add chicken or fish to select vegan and veggie recipes each week for an added protein boost. And with Green Chef, I always feel bad about ordering things because when the box comes, it's like more waste for the earth. But you are actually reducing your food waste by up to 38% when you're shopping with Green Chef because they've done all the back end and everything's recyclable and they are very committed to being sustainable. And again, most importantly, here's my personal endorsement. It tastes good. Like... Oh, yeah. Above all the other stuff, the thing that's important to me is that when I eat the food, I'm happy to be eating it. It's really delicious food. And I got to say, go to greenchef.com slash quitters60 and use code quitters60 to get 60% off plus free shipping. The number one meal kit for eating well. And saving the planet and eating well and saving the planet. Go to greenchef.com slash quitters60 and use code quitters60 to get 60% off plus free shipping. Good, 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 Green Chef. I just made it up. Go to greenchef.com slash quitters60 and use code quitters60 to get 60% off plus free shipping. This episode of Quitters is brought to you by Primal Kitchen. Guess where I was last week, Chad? Where were you? New York City. And I was staying what? with my cousin, whom I love very much. Shout out to Colin. Mm-hmm. Guess what he had? I was gonna. I was just cooking in the morning, making some eggs. What did he have? Primal Kitchen avocado oil spray for the pan. Just there. Oh, cool. I didn't bring it. I didn't. I didn't promote it to him on his I, own, independently. I was so happy and so proud because that is a staple in our mm. kitchen right now. It is an absolute staple. I use it for everything. It's the perfect pan prep. I just made that word up. Pan Delicious. prep. Pan prep. That's a real pan word. Prep. Is well, it? we have all kind of Primal Kitchen stuff in our kitchen, including the avocado pan spray. We also have stuff like the vegan sweet potato fries, the pesto keto cauliflower pizza. We just have like delicious Primal Kitchen-ness all over the place. You know, I was a child of the 80s. Back then, it was all no fat, no fat, no fat. <laughs> and Because you need good fats. You need plant-based oils and no refined sugar, and you also need delicious flavor so that you'll actually eat the food. Plant-based oils, you need them. They're part of your diet. They're, they're an important thing for your brain and your body. And when I eat Primal Kitchen, yeah. I fill up, I feel good, I don't crash. I like it. I feel the same way. I feel like I'm eating real food, and then afterward, I feel like I have energy. I feel like I can just like, it's not all like screw squishy and lumped up in my body somewhere. I don't feel gassy. <laughs> I just feel like I can, I feel like I can lay down and I don't have to like sit up till my food digests. It's great. I'm a pretty clean eater. Uh, Primal Kitchen slotted in really nicely with my, with my current 
diet. They just made it easier and they gave me more options. I really like it. I like their um, salad dressings. I use them for everything, by the way. I use them to mm. marinate, pour it on, on salads, put it on uh, vegetables, anything you want. But Quitters listeners can save 20% at primalkitchen.com slash quitters or like my cousin did, find Primal Kitchen products at your favorite local grocery store or retailer. Do it. It's so yummy. You are really uh, a fascinating breath of fresh air. I want to talk about relationships more because I feel like it's the one thing that you admit that you're not 100% sure about. And mm. not. I don't give any shit about the specifics of it. Mm. But does human connection as important to you as uh, sort of artistic integrity or finding a place to put your passion? Yeah, I've realized how much I can come up short in that regard. Um, and I think that my, <laughs> the thing that um, always constantly seems to haunt me or, or um, is I'm always trying to figure out, uh, I'm very self-critical and I think, it, I, I like to think of it, myself as self-critical in a way that's hopefully positive if I see that as a, as a flaw or like a, fa a shortcoming. Uh -huh. My ability to balance as it, as, it, as it comes to relationships and this, you know, thing that we're talking about, whatever this is, uh, integrity is maybe not the right word, but like something, this need, this desire to get this thing, whatever this thing is out there and, and to make, or just to make stuff, you know, and, and mean it. To balance that with not even just another life, but just um, people in your life, you know? And, I, and it can, doesn't have to be even romantic relationships, even with friends, like um, oh, being yeah. able to like... I'd love to be the guy who will remember to text you or send you that letter. It's not you. Nobody in my friend group will say that that's, I'm that guy. But you do have friends who have stuck by you through all of this. You've and by the way, no, I'm a, I think I'm a very good friend, but I just have a very, there's an emotion. I think there's an emotional, there's out of sight, out of mind to a certain degree. Um, and I, when I'm with my friends, I'm very present with them, but I think I could do a better job of maintenance. I'm not good at maintenance mm. in any capacity. Mm. <laughs> like, no, I, 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 I get that. I'm just wondering how that, how do you see that playing out in 10 years, 20 years, mm. constant yeah, following know. of passion, uh, uh, artistic output, but like, are you do become like a almost tragically lonely figure because yeah. you're isolated by your passion? Yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing, right? That's the thing that we all, um, when you're younger, it's like it's the never-ending rotation of um, of friends and new people that you'll meet. And as we all know, as you get older, that um, the, the great joke is that uh, what you, that revolving door gets slower and slower of, of new people in your life. Keeping your heart open and uh, allowing yourself to mm, be taken uh, by by someone and somebody who who's, also interested in the same thing. You seem incredibly feeling driven. It feels like you you move toward the thing that is like kind of uh, going to come out of you anyway a little bit. Mm -hmm. Does that make it difficult for you to plan, like for you to look deep into the future? Do you look deep into the future? It is very like moment to moment in the now. I mean, but I also like have visions of like what I think of myself at each each age. Uh, bracket and i think that like i mean i wouldn't be standing here i wouldn't have you know directed a movie written a book wrote an, wrote an album and you know all the other crap that i've done in my life uh by 30 if at 17 i wasn't like that's what i'm gonna do so that 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 ability to see uh, to paint a version of yourself and then try to get to it and obviously ultimately always fail it but try to get as close as you can and then you go look at 40 or 50 and you do the same thing yet again but this time at 40 and 50 there's different things in my mind. There's lifestyle. There's joy. There's and to to your to your point, Julie, like you can price you can price yourself out of the market, or you can like you know what I mean. You can like um, if you don't open up early enough, or you don't like allow space for your life to have community in it. It's not less about relationships and friendships. Right. And just, I want to like the general sense, the general word of community. Right. We. I mean, when. Um, you know, capitalism steps in for community, right? Work, workaholics, uh, buying things. Uh, we're not doing, I mean, uh, community centers are empty. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. In right. our areas. Like there's just no uh, less, like we're online now. Like there's the, the sense of community is less and less. And so, yeah, I guess when I look at myself into the future and I paint those versions of myself, 
to try to hit. Creating a sense of community is now my one of my uh, passions and for and yourself. Hope for myself, yeah. For yourself, do you have any sense that there's a difference between your inside and your outside? Mm, you mean like my internal world and like what you do? Your internal world in the way that you express yourself. You don't seem right now in your present incarnation as somebody who is filtering or concerned about how it's going to land. No. Um, you're just being really, you are yourself. It's a very unique quality. You don't see that very often. You sure as fuck don't see it very often in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And I kind of wonder where that, I'm not sure you can answer where it came from. I guess what I want to ask is, does anything scare you? I mean, like being that honest. Yeah. yeah. Does there is there any kind of time you go ooh like stop because pull yourself up short because you you were nervous about saying or doing something that is part of your internal mm. being. I think some people are daredevils. Part of what I like about directing movies and making things and doing stuff that's very different than maybe what people might expect from me or what I've done before is I there is a certain level of social fearlessness that I whatever I have, you know? Um, and so being this honest, it doesn't feel scary, even though it obviously is. And like, you can look at a thing and like um, every once in a while, like I'll read a thing that I might have said, or I'll look at a thing. It's also, it's always reading in it, by the way. It's always the, it's always the... Um, Cause it, yeah, because it sounds different when it's written down and excerpted. It looks Which is like why I like doing podcasts now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I think I make I sense. It. I make sense as a person communicating. I don't make sense when there's another uh, person filtering yeah. uh, what I'm saying. Because they're doing the filtering for me and then they do it wrong. <laughs> 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 so I'm like, don't do it. <laughs> just let me just roll. You know? Chad, what is this making you think? I think I feel connected to him. Like, I feel like I, his form of communication feels very familiar in, in some way. Like, he talks the way that some, I feel like the thoughts are in my head a little bit. And I feel like a lot of people probably feel like that, which is why people gravitate to you. Julie, when you said like, you, you, you split, you were like, there's over here, there's being charming and over here, there's being real. And I feel like he's really charming because he's real. Like, I, I, I think that Hollywood that says those two things are different. And I right. think like... I'm, just, I'm referring more to his older sort of persona that I've seen on TV. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. On YouTube clips where it's just like, hey, you know, very... Welcome to Nickelodeon. How you doing? Exactly. Sure. Like blah, blah, blah. You, you know, I'm not very you... good at selling things, period. I mean, to be perfectly honest. How did you sell your movie? <laughs> um, yeah. Like, it was basically a blitzkrieg uh, approach. It was all, all things, everything, anything that would go. <laughs> I was like, at some point I was like posting um, some Brazilian uh, fans was making these really very, like, very sweet, very sort of like, just uh, like the poster of the movie at a movie theater, like photoshopped onto a yeah. thing. And I was like, we'll post that. We'll use those. I, I also think that like promotion is taken far too seriously. It's far too like, oh, it's a silly thing. Set. It's a silly thing. Like, let's just let it be silly. And um, <laughs> I cut old Victoria's clips into the movie and sent it uh, as promo, promo. Like, just stupid shit, you know? I did that. But somebody bought it. I mean, somebody, when, when the movie starts, there's like four different producing partners. Yeah. Oh, you mean like the... This there's is like, Highlander you know, this is like, <laughs> and there's Canada Film Condition. And there's... I mean, I was it, like, oh my God. This know this film has been... Uh, has been uh, like p pulled into the world kicking and screaming by, by you know, like it's it's the, the 10,000 producers that it takes to make a movie like this. But yeah, no, it is. That's it, right? But ordinarily, the more producers you see like that and the more different entities you see at the top of a movie, the more of a Franken movie it's going to be that yeah, doesn't right. have a point of view, right? You absolutely have a point of view. Being upset enough to continue having those fights to, making sh to make sure that it's still the same vision that you started. Like you write a movie and then you protect it from notes. And then, but you can't vice grip or no good notes will get in. You have to have like a nice firm grip on that. So there's enough space for, for, for good notes to get in and you can keep out the bad notes. And then you go and shoot it. And then you have all the limitations of shooting. And then you do an edit and you do the same thing. All the notes come in and you have to have a handle on it. So you're constantly protecting this vision. That's why all directors are insane. It's because you're constantly... Especially on your first film, because again, like you haven't made, sometimes you haven't found the producing team that you think is going to like, you, you're always going to agree with and you guys get, get on or like there's a shorthand. 
you're constantly fighting against these, like, you know, as you said, these the entities that make a film come to, to life. Your job is just to protect the film the whole time. It does create a certain mentality that you then have to unlearn or learn how to do differently next time. Because I think the only improvement I would do if I was going to make a second film is how I felt doing it. Hmm. How and how did you feel? Yeah. Well, ecstatic, first of all. Like when I was direct when I was directing the the 18 days we shot this film. That's it? Oh yeah. Wow. 18 days. But yeah. there's during also COVID, during COVID, by the way. The, this is before there was a, a vaccine. There was uh if we got COVID, the whole movie. The whole thing got shut, shut down. down. Yeah. For yeah. those who haven't seen it yet, there's a the 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 lead character, her name is Mouse, and she's also she's a cartoonist. So they mm. actually some of the scenes are cartoon they're animated, they're they're, yeah. they're animated was that included in your 18 days that has to be extra oh no that was extra okay, yeah we okay, had to okay, we okay, didn't, okay. i mean we didn't shoot those we did those in post but like of the 18 days of shooting the film itself yeah it, it was uh it was a whirlwind like really a, a, a world a whirlwind and I'm, I'm just happy that like it's very hard to make a cohesive film in that amount of time there's a reason why directors made films like you know uh, Going back to, to like sort of like the sort of type of the the industry stuff, the um, the days are days. The shoot times are getting shorter and shorter. And so, right. if you're wondering to yourself why any of these films don't have a certain point of view that you're watching, audience out there, it's because there's no time yeah. to do that, to think about it, to experiment. So, what would you there's have no done time. differently to make yourself right, on your next movie? Yeah, just uh, really fight for. More fighting. More fighting. I love this guy. I well, love got, it. I love you. You have to yeah. you have to be elbows out, right? Because what's <laughs> sacred is the actor and the shooting and the director and the DP and our ability to explore that scene and explore all available options for that scene. Mm-hmm. But the TVification of the industry has made it so it's like stand on the mark, turn, do the thing, boom, boom, boom. Oh, can we shoot it in a line? Mm-hmm. So that we never have the turn is really right. clean and we don't have to do it three different ways. Right. right. Like it like the TVification has affected indie filmmaking. And so therefore, right. like, and so you what I would say is that like elbows out and fight for the just the time for all of us to be together, find a way to uh to be excited and joyful and just maintain that um energy. And that just takes uh, you know, you know, <laughs> meditating and shit. <laughs> do you do that? Do you yeah. meditate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have any desire to 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 wrestle this enormous creative and and uh, uh, this sort of curiosity and energy? Do you wish it was less? You seem tormented <laughs> and very brilliant. Brilliant. I mean, I could spend all day with you. You're right up my alley. I love. I like where your brain goes. It's sort of like we're covered addicts, or you see old people that are or are brave, and and I'll I'll make all that make sense. Um, when you're young, when you're like 19, uh-huh. you're brave. And young people get praised for being brave all the time. When you're brave and you're long, people are like, wow. But show me somebody who's 55 who knows all of the baggage and has to work around all that stuff to yeah. be brave, to, to yeah. try the new class, to go to the thing, uh-huh. to attempt, to take the first step. Uh-huh. That to me is a way more interesting person and their bravery is more true to me. Mm-hmm. It's been tested by fire and by life. And I'm, I'm, I'm an idiot. I don't know anything. I really don't. I, um, I'm always fascinated by how uh, stupid I can be constantly. But the awareness, to have all this awareness and to move through it and move past it and adjust and like, and like the sort of soreness in the body of all that awareness and then to be able to be calm and ge- gentle and sweet and simple with not just yourself, but with people and relationships and keep your life simple. That to me is, is more impressive and hard, way harder to do. And it's more lasting. It's not, Can it can't be it? shattered. I'm working on it. I'll let you know if it works. <laughs> I'm working on it. I was going to ask if you consider yourself to be a fearful person and, and, and also if you consider yourself to be a, a brave person. Well, I think I, I, the reason why I use the analogy of the brave person and the and the the young brave person, and the old brave person, is because I was the young brave person. I was without doubt, which is a rare thing, and maybe not the healthiest thing, or maybe not the most intelligent thing. Or it's sort of like being a UFC fighter or a boxer who's never been knocked out, uh-huh. and, and then they get knocked out once, and then they can't fight again. Right. And they all they do is get knocked out after that. 
Yeah, man. the recovery <laughs> is too intense. And for me, that's what it, like there was a time in like my mid to late twenties where I was like, I felt not brave anymore. I didn't feel, I felt shook up. I felt worried about, I felt scared to, to go on stage. I felt scared, which is where, where my obsession with like, what's the scariest thing I want to do it started to your point of like, am I brave? Am I uh, fearful? I'm, I am fearful. I'm very fearful. And my job is to not be and to, or to uh, be able to, manifest that fear into uh, upward mobility. And so getting a handle on it, being a master of that, and also uh, inviting it in and knowing it's a part of the human condition and having a, 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 a system in place to, to move around that, to work around that, to find bravery and to, to, and to, and to do the scary thing. I, I didn't know you when you were younger and I, I only know you from the last hour, but like you feel brave because I, it does seem like some things are scaring you and you're just like, just doing it anyway, because you're, you just have to do it. At some point in this, we were meant to ask you if you had quit something. And we usually like try to kind of shoehorn it into the narrative of the conversation, yeah. but you were just like clicking. So we didn't, we didn't derail you. <laughs> I was but, ranting. That's no, you weren't. No, 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 it's very really interesting. interesting. <laughs> but I, I do want to know, like maybe we can throw out, uh, throw out a couple, but I, on some level, it feels like it's kind of easy for you to quit. It feels like you're mm. like, I want that thing over there. You don't even think about the thing that you're leaving on the other side, or or do you? I've I've quit smoking to this year. Cigarettes, oh, cigarettes. That's, yeah, that's actually that's a big gigantormous. Quit. How do you Why? Feel? Huge. Um, well, it was started with this thing like a couple of years ago where I was like, okay, every year subtract a thing, add a thing. To subtract a thing, add a thing. Don't get too complicated with New Year's resolutions. Just like one thing goes, one thing stays. One mm. thing gets added. One thing comes at. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So those those three things. Like uh, like last year, I was like, I'm gonna do fitness boy. I'm gonna be a fitness guy. I was been cigarettes, coffee, and wine for like the last you know 15 years. Like right? no, I've no, I've no <laughs> you know what I mean. Like I literally don't have it in me to do this. What I wanted to do is subtract sort of like. Um, my sense of uh, having to control my environment in order to get things done or having to like put the hands on the wheel in order to drive and sort of lay back a little bit. But this year, I'm making it really easy. Subtracting, um, I'm going to quit smoking and um, I'm going to add Spanish. Nice. Because I've always wanted to learn the language. At the end that's of the a, year, at the end of the year, do you, do you still hang on to like, are you still hanging on to Fitness Boy? Is he still with you? Yeah, yeah. Well, it just works. I mean, it's um, it's been a huge solve for a lot of things in my life, and so Fitness Boy is still around. And um, there's a certain amount of time that you have in the day, and so you end up quitting things maybe accidentally that you don't mean to. But also, quitting is great. I mean, I quit. I was doing the LA thing. I was living in Los Angeles up until just the, before the pandemic. Just before the pandemic, I was like, okay, I'm done. I'm I'm gonna. I, I'm done with LA. I can't live here anymore. I'm wrapping it up. So pre-pandemic, not not pre knowing what was coming, you had already no. you were quitting. Actually, LA. the the plan was to move and travel for like a year. <laughs> yeah. Well, that didn't happen. That did not uh, happen. <laughs> that didn't happen. Spoiler. And so what I did instead, spoiler alert. Instead, you so made a I movie. Did, <laughs> well, yeah. Instead, I actually made a movie, which is even maybe more psychotic than traveling during a pandemic. Is trying to make a movie that if someone gets COVID, the movie ends. So I quit LA. I quit that particular type of staying accessible to the industry, staying close to the industry, staying uh, a part of it. I wanted to do my work in a different way. And so I quit I quit what I had been doing for 10 years, which was sort of it's a little bit scary because it's like, okay, now I'm not in the pulse of it. I'm going to like go live in the middle of the woods and travel. It was very, it was a very, um, very uh, triggering thing to, for lack of a better word, triggering thing to do because I had been part of this for so long, part of the LA idea for so long. And I never really liked it. But go back to your point. Right. Of, you I know, can't you realize, imagine you doing that. No. I don't <laughs> know why I was I doing I can't it. imagine you driving from, I cannot see you going from a studio in Los Feliz to an audition in Santa Monica <laughs> and being like, Hi, I'm Avin. I'm 28 years old. Judge me, uh, judge me, judge me. I'm, yeah. you know, 5'11", profile, yeah. profile, words, words. Like, yeah. I do not see you in that world. And yet, you're telling me you were 
you were doing that. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like we can all get, we can all get, um, even so, like, that's my point. She had your other point of like clarity, like awareness does not mean clarity. Like mm-hmm. I, I was doing the thing. I was aware of all the systems, but being aware of what was spiritually right for me was unseeable. Yes. Being aware of what was actually right for me as a human being, what I actually needed to make myself happy in a larger existential level, not just happy in a simple level, but a really happy. Were you were you looking for it and it just wasn't there, or or did you not even know to look for it? Didn't didn't even know to look for it. It wasn't until like um, there was a moment of like, this isn't working for me anymore, I, and I could see myself like the wick becoming shorter and shorter. Uh huh. That I was like, why am I losing all this wick? I'm doing things that I like doing. I'm acting. I'm doing the things this is that I like to do. And then it wasn't until I realized that my wick was so short that I was like, oh, uh, and I was sort of had I sort of had a moment where like I cut all ties from everything. And then I started directing the film. But I am really this now sort of letting go of the wheel for a little bit and seeing what what will happen happen next. Cause I did the last 10 years like that. Right. Right. In LA, doing the thing, hands on the wheel, let's go, let's try, let's put my best foot forward. And now I, I just don't know. Um, I don't know if I, that's not working for me anymore. Would you be disappointed in yourself or feel that you had somehow dropped the ball if you were took joy in or were pleased by the performance of a movie that you had done that is about a topic that is bleak, that is about the the treatment of black and brown bodies and how uh, people uh, people are disenfranchised and overlooked are you allowed to be proud and happy or does that undercut it somewhat i think that there's two beasts there right like there's the medicine and the sugar i'm proud of the sugar i think i made a good film that you can like mm-hmm. walk away from having enjoyed and not feel you know I, I always like to make the analogy there's two movies about heroin there's requiem for a dream yeah which you can watch once yeah. Yep. And then there's train spotting, which you oh, can watch I've a bunch of times. Watched a hundred times. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so that was my whole point about doing a movie about this subject matter. So do I take joy? I take joy in the sugar of the film. Uh-huh. I think it's uh-huh. a fun, electric, bright, punk rock, tiny little film with a DIY energy. Yeah. Um, and I hope that people can watch this and see the darkness, see the the reflection as it is, even though it's a fairy tale comic book world, the reflection as it, as it is to our real world and feel empowered. I don't think anyone should walk out of the movie feeling worse than had uh, than how they started when they got in. Because uh-huh. for me, it was helplessness, uh, feeling ineffectual and feckless and, and um, not ability, the lacking of ability to affect the world around me in a, in a positive way. Uh, to making this film. So I'm hoping that if people feel that way going in, then they can leave being like, I do feel like it's possible and feel empowered and feel like it's there's ability to do things and change. Um, I, yeah, I think we're up against it. I, yeah. I mean, you... We definitely are. This is, we're up but against this my was bladder, like, yeah, for sure. Far, far yeah. from an air burger. <laughs> but, like, me too. Um, but that, but the, go see, go, go, see the movie. See, see the movie. Mouse. I do. I just want to say, you know, sometimes people come in here and like we spend the first twenty minutes trying to get them to like change the channel to something that they actually think and feel, and it feels like <laughs> we didn't we didn't have to do that <laughs> not at, at all. all with you. And that's, I mean, I think like. I, you know, I hope I look up like 20 years from now and you still are like on whatever channel you actually are on because it's very, <laughs> I think it's very charming. Like, I think it's awesome. very, I, very I love cool. it too. I love your, Thanks, I love you for being open and, and earnest. I love the fight in you. And I think all of that is, is really well realized in Dormouse. I can't recommend it enough, especially as a, uh, somebody who lived in Vancouver in the nineties. It felt so, it, it felt great. It, it mm. feels, and, and it, you're right, it is satisfying. You do leave it because we do have heroes and we have bad guys. And as much as there's a dark underbelly there, it is a very satisfying movie to see. So thank you for sharing yourself with us today. And, uh, and thank you thanks for, for being movie. here, man. Yeah, no, th- thanks for having me, guys. Really, really fun. 